In the heart of Japan's rapidly growing aviation industry, engineers at Nakajima Aircraft Company were quietly crafting a machine that would change the course of aerial warfare. What they built was no ordinary engine. It was the Nakajima Sakai, a compact high-performance radial powerhouse that would lift the infamous Zero into the skies. Sleek, silent, and deceptively deadly, this engine didn't just power planes, it powered an ideology of dominance. But behind its polished cowling lay a tale of innovation, desperation, and devastating consequence. Today, we uncover the hidden truth behind one of the most feared engines of World War II. The Birth of Sake, Japan's Answer to a Growing Threat In the early 1930s, Japan's military leadership knew they were behind. The Western powers had larger economies, better manufacturing, and more powerful aircraft. So, Japan's strategy shifted. Instead of matching American and British brute force, they'd focus on mobility, range, and agility. That required a new kind of engine, light, efficient, and reliable. In 1937, Nakajima took up the challenge and developed the Sakai. Initially labelled the Ha-25, it evolved into the Sakai-12 and later the Sakai-21, both delivering just over 1,000 horsepower. These engines didn't aim to overpower, they were built to outmaneuver. With a small frontal area and minimal weight, the Sakai became Japan's engineering weapon of choice. But in the rush to match rising geopolitical threats, Japan prioritized performance over durability. The result was a brilliant engine tuned for early war blitz tactics, but wholly unprepared for a prolonged global conflict. The Sakai was Japan's answer to Allied domination, but it was an answer written in compromise and one that would eventually cost them dearly. Designing for domination, compact power with a deadly mission, Lightweight, streamlined, deadly. The Nakajima Sakai wasn't just an engine, it was an extension of Japan's strategic vision. At just under 1,000 pounds, it was one of the lightest engines of its power class. Its design featured two rows of seven air-cooled cylinders, each precisely machined to minimize weight and maximize thermal efficiency. A single-stage, single-speed supercharger added high-altitude power without excessive complexity. This allowed aircraft like the Mitsubishi A6M0 to fly faster, climb quicker, and stay airborne longer than most early Allied fighters. But what made it so lethal was how seamlessly it fit the Japanese airframe philosophy. With the Sakai, Planes could be smaller, lighter, and more agile than anything the Allies were ready for in 1941. Yet every gram shaved off came with a price. The engine lacked armor protection, and fuel lines weren't self-sealing. Any hit was potentially fatal. The push for maximum range led to dangerously lean fuel mixtures, which increased stress on the cylinders. And while it dazzled in short missions, it struggled in sustained operations. The Sakai wasn't built to win a drawn-out war. It was built for ambushes, raids, and early victory. As the skies grew more contested, its weaknesses became glaring and deadly. Inside the Sakai, engineering elegance or wartime compromise? Take a wrench to the Sakai, and you'll uncover one of the most deceptively complex engines of the Second World War. With its 14 cylinders arranged in a tight two-row radial configuration, the Sakai was a mechanical ballet of timing, airflow, and fuel delivery. It featured dual magnetos, a centrifugal supercharger, and an updraft carburetor that kept the fuel-air mixture stable until the plane went inverted. Then, power could cut out mid-maneuver. It wasn't just the fuel system that revealed compromises. The crankcase was built from lightweight alloys that were vulnerable to heat stress. Valve guides, often uncooled, could warp under pressure. The spark plugs were notoriously difficult to access for maintenance, especially in the field. 
and because the engine was optimized for weight savings, wear on components was rapid and unavoidable. Unlike American engines which were overbuilt to survive punishment, the Sakai ran close to its breaking point at all times. It was efficient but fragile, powerful but short-lived. Japanese engineers walked a razor's edge between innovation and implosion. And while they succeeded in delivering an engine that could dominate early battles, it was a machine that burned brightly and briefly under the weight of its own limitations. Zero plus Sakai, a lethal marriage of airframe and engine. What happens when you pair an engine built for agility with an airframe designed to vanish in the sky? You get the Mitsubishi A6M0, the perfect partner for the Nakajima Sakai. Together, they formed a combination so effective, it terrified Allied pilots from the Philippines to the Coral Sea. The Zero's long wingspan and lightweight structure, matched with the Sakai's smooth output, gave it unmatched maneuverability. Dogfights became death sentences for slower, heavier planes. With a top speed over 330 miles per hour and an operational range beyond 1,500 miles, the Zero could strike far, fight hard, and fly home, often without a scratch. The Sakai enabled this by delivering reliable power while consuming less fuel than most Western engines. Yet, the Harmony masked serious flaws. Neither engine nor airframe was armored. A single bullet to a fuel tank or oil line could turn the Zero into a fireball. And as newer Allied aircraft arrived with better speed, firepower and protection, the Sakai's limitations were exposed. It wasn't upgradable, and Japan's material shortages meant improvements came too late. What had once been a deadly duo became easy prey. The Sakai and Zero started the war as predators. By 1944, they were outclassed, outrun, and outgunned. The Cooling Puzzle – Performance Limits and Tactical Trade-Offs In theory, the Sakai's air-cooled radial design should have kept it cooler than inline engines. In practice, it was a different story. Japanese mechanics fought an invisible war against heat. With its tightly packed cylinders and compact cowling, the Sakai struggled to dissipate thermal buildup, especially during aggressive climbing or tight turns. Rear cylinders suffered most, hidden from direct airflow. Pilots reported engines overheating within minutes during prolonged combat. Oil temperatures skyrocketed, cylinder heads cracked, and once the engine hit its thermal ceiling, performance dipped dramatically or failed altogether. Nakajima engineers tried to mitigate this with airflow baffles and cowl flaps, but it was never enough. Even changes in propeller pitch couldn't fully relieve the strain. In tropical theatres like Guadalcanal, the problem intensified. Maintenance crews worked around the clock to keep engines alive, often cannibalizing multiple aircraft to keep one operational. The Sakai demanded respect and patience. Overheating didn't just mean shorter engine life. It meant pilots had to fly conservatively, throttling back when they should have surged. In a war where every second mattered, the cooling crisis became a silent killer. What should have been the Sakai's strength, its simplicity, was compromised by the one thing you can't fight in the air, heat. Battle-tested from China to Pearl Harbor and beyond. Before it stunned the US Navy at Pearl Harbor, the Sakai had already seen combat and bloodshed in China. During Japan's brutal invasion in the late 1930s, early prototypes of the Sakai powered Mitsubishi A5M clawed fighters over Nanjing and Chongqing. These missions helped iron out mechanical kinks, but also offered a disturbing preview of Japan's rising air power. By the time the Mitsubishi A6M0 entered frontline service in 1940, the Sakai was ready to reshape the Pacific theater. When the Zero debuted in China, Allied pilots were stunned. It could outclimb, outturn, and outrun everything they had. 
That fear only deepened after Pearl Harbor, when swarms of Zeros powered by Sakai engines obliterated airfields across Oahu. From the Philippines to Wake Island, the engine proved itself battle-hardened, pushing Japanese victories from the air. But victories carried a hidden cost. Each campaign put mounting pressure on Japan's stretched industrial base. Logistics faltered, maintenance quality dropped, and the Sakai began to suffer. What was once a finely tuned weapon started to show the cracks of overuse. It wasn't just a technical limit. It was a strategic one. The Sakai had won battles, but it couldn't win a war without support Japan couldn't afford to give. Cracks in the armor, reliability issues, and late war struggles. By 1943, the Sakai's dominance was under siege. The Allies had adapted. New aircraft like the F-6F Hellcat and F-4U Corsair weren't just faster, they were heavily armored and better armed. Suddenly, the Sakai-powered Zero found itself outgunned and underprotected, and beneath the cowling, things were unraveling. Years of high production quotas, raw material shortages, and bombing raids on Japanese factories had degraded engine quality. Mechanics noted warped cylinder heads, leaking seals, and crankcases that cracked under stress. Some engines barely reached 100 flight hours before needing overhaul. Worse still, replacement parts were becoming scarce, forcing crews to improvise with recycled or makeshift components. Pilots were now flying on faith and fading steel. To compensate, Nakajima tried to introduce the Sakai 31 with more power, but the improvements were marginal and reliability remained poor. Maintenance crews were overworked. Training programs rushed, and Japan's once formidable engine was now a liability. By Iwo Jima and Okinawa, Sakai-equipped aircraft were easy prey. The engine that had once ruled the skies was being left behind piece by piece. Reliability wasn't just mechanical, it was moral. And the men flying these planes knew they were up against not just superior machines, but the slow failure of their own. The Allied response, outclassed or outnumbered? When Allied pilots first encountered the Sakai-powered Zero, panic followed. Reports from Burma and the Philippines described a ghost-like fighter that could turn on a dime and outrun pursuit. The US military scrambled to understand what made the engine-airframe combo so deadly. Intelligence teams studied captured Zeros and quickly identified the Sakai's strengths. Lightweight design, efficient power output, and streamlined integration. But they also noted glaring weaknesses. No armor, no self-sealing fuel tanks, and dangerously lean construction. American strategy shifted. Instead of matching the Zero in maneuverability, the goal became outlasting and overpowering it. Enter the Grumman F6F Hellcat and the Vought F4U Corsair, beasts with more horsepower, better survivability, and faster dive speeds. By late 1943, these aircraft weren't just holding their own, they were dominating. The Sakai, once a terror, now struggled to keep pace. In head-to-head -head matchups, the Sakai engine's weaknesses became glaringly obvious. Inverted flight cut fuel, long climbs overheated cylinders, and sustained engagements exposed its thin skin and short lifespan. The Allies had found the cracks, and they drove wedges through them. The Sakai wasn't outclassed in design, it was outclassed in support, strategy, and scale. And in war, being brilliant isn't enough. You have to endure. Fade to silence. The jet age and the end of Sakai's reign. As 1945 approached, the roar of the Sakai was being drowned out by a new sound, the high-pitched scream of jet engines. While Germany was fielding the Mi-262 and the Allies tested early jet prototypes, Japan's piston-driven arsenal looked increasingly obsolete. 
The Sakai, already struggling under battlefield wear and industrial decline, was now technically outmatched. Nakajima and the Japanese military attempted to adapt, pivoting to more powerful engines like the Hama, and even experimenting with their own jet designs like the Nakajima Kika, but it was too little, too late. The Sakai never evolved beyond its original configuration. There were no radical redesigns, no hybrid upgrades, no leap into turbocharging or water injection systems like the Americans had with their R2800s. Instead, the engine quietly faded, its signature hum lost beneath Allied thunder. By the time atomic bombs fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Sakai was already a relic of a vanishing era. Japan's once legendary engine was grounded, not by one fatal flaw, but by the steady march of technology, compounded by war-worn supply chains. The jet age didn't just retire the Sakai, it erased its future. What was once a marvel now sits frozen in time, trapped between brilliance and obsolescence. Legacy of the Sakai, reverence, regret, and rediscovery. Today, only a few Sakai engines remain in working condition, mostly in restored zeros maintained by warbird enthusiasts or tucked away in aviation museums. When one of them is fired up, the ground trembles and a piece of history growls back to life. But the legacy of the Sakai is more than mechanical. It's philosophical. It reminds us that brilliance in design doesn't guarantee survival in war. It also teaches that wartime success often hinges less on what an engine can do in a lab and more on what it can survive in the field. The Sakai was ahead of its time in some ways and woefully behind in others. It symbolizes the paradox of Japanese wartime engineering, elegant, efficient and deadly, yet overextended undersupported and doomed by strategic overreach. Post-war engineers learned from it. Modern Japanese aerospace design still echoes the Sakai's emphasis on compact efficiency. But historians see it as something deeper, a warning against designing for perfection while ignoring endurance. In a war that turned into a global grind, the Sakai was simply not built to last. Revered and regretted, the Nakajima Sakai remains a ghost of what might have been. Still beautiful, still dangerous, but ultimately defeated by the future it couldn't reach. The Nakajima Sakai was more than just an engine. It was a reflection of Japan's wartime ambition and technological genius. It gave rise to legends, reshaped air combat, and terrified a world that didn't yet understand it. But in the end, it was outpaced outlasted and forgotten by history's louder machines. Still, its story endures, one of power, innovation, and the price of perfection. If you found this deep dive into forgotten engines fascinating, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment below. What other aviation icons should we uncover next? Until then, keep your eyes on the skies and your curiosity burning.